<laughs> First of all, apologies for the long-winded bio. Uh, when David invited me a few weeks ago, it, um, I actually was here last year. I said, oh, just use the same stuff as last year. I would have used the short version <laughs> had I bothered checking. So uh, thanks to uh, Mayan and David and Tom for inviting me here today for a repeat engagement. Uh, thanks to all of you for sticking out at the end. Um, I'm here in the coveted slot of the last speaker of the day after a three-day conference on a Friday, a sunny Friday afternoon in June. <laughs> so I can anticipate lots of attendance. Or now I'm standing between people leaving early and catching happy hour or their flights. Um, this was an interesting talk. Sort of didn't get. I think we didn't decide until a few weeks ago about this. And really, all I was given was the topic of fire and EHR interoperability. Last year, when I was here. Um, same time, I think I also spoke at this breakout session. There were several talks on fire, and I heard a lot of discussion throughout the conference. This year, I could find only two references <laughs> to fire. Thanks to Rim for bringing it up. It was the first time I heard it today. <laughs> the other reference was actually in the other workout <laughs> workshop today, which is a little puzzling, because in my world, we seem to hear about fire all the time. What I did on this broad topic was to um, take a combination of things. Um, talk a little bit about what interoperability means with, it, with fire, but also trying to figure out briefly, I'll give you a brief tutorial on what fire is and um, what is currently going on, which I think is the most important thing. And when we talk about fire and interoperability, well, it's almost a synonym from our perspective. Tom already mentioned the HL7 vision and um, mission, and, and I love the vision. In fact, when I came, I made one slight change in my contribution, which was insert the words the right there. But the idea of securely accessing and using the right health data when and where you want to need it, well, that's kind of the definition of interoperability. And that's the reason for existence of HL7. And as we'll see, that's why FIRE came into existence. And what we do is we provide standards that actually make it possible to achieve that. And again, that's how these things fit together. Now, in the history of HL7, we actually had our 30th birthday last year. Uh, there have been a sequence of different standards-related projects. The original product, don't ask me why, it was V2. I don't know what happened to V1. <laughs> there was no V1. But um, V2 came out uh, back around 1992, I think it was first published. And it was published in a day, we've heard a lot about uh, Actually, Scott's talk today about saying no web for research, uh, no web for healthcare. Uh, it, it was published before the web, World Wide Web came into existence. Back then, it was a day of mm, 1,200 baud modems, plugged them into your telephone <laughs> sometimes, sometimes with those little receptor, receiver uh, harnesses that you plugged in. Um, and uh, the internet was really a way of exchanging information through a text-based command line interface. You did FTP, you did Telnet, uh, you basically couldn't do very much on it. And the World Wide Web came into existence in the early 90s and really transformed everything by providing this graphical user interface that suddenly made this rather complicated, inscrutable technical environment accessible to people. And in those days, um, there actually were graphical user environments. There was uh, Prodigy and AOL, a few others out there that were trying to sort of make you know, the internet a little more easier to work with. They were actually not really internet-based, but they had their own proprietary communication hubs. And those worked for a while. Uh, they all disappeared eventually because the internet and the World Wide Web in particular took everything over and became this sort of hub and pulse of information throughout uh, throughout the whole world of technology, and that's where we are today. And in a sense, that's where fire is. V2 was designed for that early age, and so it was really a period of scarcity when you had these slow telephone communication-based transport mechanisms. And so it was based on very simplistic, uh, short text transmissions and segments with um, bar delimiters, trying to take as little space as possible in order to deal with this small um, communications bandwidth that was available then. And uh, as a result, uh, it, was, it was a blinding success. I mean, basically, uh, the, the word is 90% of the healthcare institutions use V2 somewhere, whether they know it or not. <laughs> it runs the basic operations of, um, of uh, orders and observations and building throughout many healthcare environments right now. But it wasn't truly interoperable. Uh, the way it worked was to sort of sketch out some commonly used pieces, blocks of information, 
and then had this ability, the Z segment, of basically extending it for point-to-point -point communications. And that's where it was, really. It was a way for the point of care to communicate to the lab or the billing office or between one institution and another, but always a point-to-point -point thing, not really interoperability, where you have, you know, create once and use many places with many different users. Uh, it, around the turn of the century, 2000, HL7 decided that they were going to come up with a better solution that was going to be truly interoperable, and that was V3. And V3 was a um, total different approach to moving information around. It took advantage of, it was based on a model-driven approach, whereas they were going to design the world as a massive information model and then be able to derive particular standard specifications out of it. There was a lot of effort over a decade or so in V3. Um, and uh, it was, I, I call it the sort of a, you know, a, a, a grand ambitious experiment, but it didn't quite work. Uh, when it came out, basically, they ended up with a very, very complex, uh, hard to follow standard that was really only understood by a very, very small number of people. And so it wasn't something that the greater community of developers could work with. It certainly wasn't human readable. It used very abstract notations and descriptions. And it was really hard to see what was going on there. So V3 was not a success. And that actually led HL7. They recognized that hmm, V3 is not going to replace V2. And uh, it, it, while it was implemented in some countries to some extent, it was a lot of expense, a lot of work. And even after doing that, they found out it wasn't quite interoperable because you couldn't really exchange information and have it go through smoothly and be understood without loss of meaning. And so the HL7 at that point, they commissioned a task force called the Fresh Look Task Force. And uh, they, they, asked, they, they asked this basic question, okay, V2 was good, but not good enough based on old technology but, and not really interoperable. And V3 was too complicated, over-engineered, <laughs> not really solving the problem. What would we do if we could start all over, but not forget everything we learned along the way? And what if we took a focus on, rather than complexity and, and trying to solve every problem in the world in one massive piece, simplicity and ease of implementation? So changing our audience from the sort of grand thinkers and modelers to basically everyone out there is working with information. And that's what led to FIRE. So, FIRE stands for Fast Healthcare Interoperability Resources. I thought of this being my only slide, but because <laughs> it kind of says it all. So fast, first of all, really easy to learn and develop using the most modern technologies. I'll go through this a little more detail later. Um, so it's quick to put things together, quick to get access, quick to make it usable from any different source. Healthcare, that's the domain we're working on. Right in the name there, interoperability. <laughs> the whole point is to be interoperable. So we talked about the old internet to the world wide web. Think of fire as the cloud, sort of going from point to point transmission to putting everything in the cloud. And then resources, we'll get into that a little more later. Those are the fundamental building blocks of how you represent information within the world of fire. Uh, fire has had a lot of excitement and traction throughout the industry for a lot of reasons I'll go into along the way. Uh, one of the, the best uh, descriptions from it is from our friend John Haramka, who's a <laughs> and he calls it the HTML of healthcare. And so what he was trying to say in that, this is the standard way that we can build a global interoperable environment much like the World Wide Web was. But he used the HTML of healthcare, and actually Graham Greve, who is the father and the author of uh, FIRE, calls it, it's plain and simple, I don't know if Scott's still here, he left, right? Yeah, he had to clear wedding. The web for healthcare. Now, Scott said there isn't any web uh, in the world of healthcare. I'd contend that's what FIRE is intended to be and already is. It's sort of the stage of, let's say, early 90s, mid 90s is where it is right now. And we're going to see it get to where we are today much more quickly than what happened there. So that's exactly how I think of FIRE. We think of it as a platform standard. It's not just a way of representing information, it's really a platform environment that you can use to do anything related to healthcare interoperability. And some of the key reasons why it's so important is it is completely free, it's an open standard, and it's supported by a rapidly growing, robust, deeply engaged global community. There are people all around the world, thousands of them, who are really harnessing around this like around a beehive of activity. And it's an amazing thing to see. I've never seen it before, having worked in another industry around standards. 
Um, it's one of these things that uh, it's part, one of its biggest damages. It's easy to get overhyped, as I will do right now, <laughs> because it is, you have to think of it as an evolutionary path and think of it as where we are in terms of where we're, versus where we're going to be. What we have here is something that's very special, very unique, and very powerful. Uh, one, one quote that I use a lot is Chuck Jaffe's one here, which is, uh, you know, we've been developing standards at HL7 for ages. We've seen presentations from other standards at this conference, uh, Nate, uh, direct. And by the way, I was not at the conference until today, so I may say things that are totally wrong. If so, go ahead and raise your hand. We don't need to wait to the end for questions. I know everyone else has asked, but uh, actually I like to, especially if I'm wrong, correct me. Um, so there may have been other things, not knowing what other people said. I'll talk a little bit about some of the talks we had this morning. Uh, a standard is used not because it's there, it's because people use it. And this is Metcalf's law, just talking about the value of a network as it increases with the more users. What we're seeing with FHIR is an incredible adoption pattern in all around the world uh, that I don't think we've seen in the world of healthcare before. Uh, one of the driving forces in the US is the support of the US government behind FHIR. Um, so, this is the annual report every year. The, the ONC, the Office of the National Coordinator, produces a report to Congress. Uh, this is actually a similar thing was said in 2015, in fact, even before that, I think. <laughs> but uh, this one, November 2016, really put, puts a lot of emphasis on the use of fire, and specifically as the means to actually make an open API that will really open up the world of healthcare information to consumers in particular. And they have sum up some of the things which I'll cover as well, that you can use fire in lots of different contexts. They talk about mobile phones, cloud, data sharing, server communication, um, in large uh, provider organizations. But its main goal, I mean, it's from their perspective, is saying this was a way to achieve this vision of an open API that would be able to deliver a patient's data to themselves, which is really one of the critical pieces of, of uh, the whole interoperability framework. Um, we've had a lot of transitions in the political environment in the US, and uh, we know that there are lots of questions about what's gonna happen next. The good news, I think, from a fire perspective is that both Tom Price and, um, who's the assistant uh, uh, secretary who was just appointed, another former congressman, they both stated that of the things we want to keep, interoperability is at the top of the list. And uh, that's really important information because there's gonna be a lot of things cut back. But they recognize that this is an enabling technology, an enabling factor, which is really critical for really being able to do anything to, to basically improve the world of healthcare. Uh, within ONC, um, they actually were anxious to jump on the fire bandwagon super sooner, maybe, than we were ready for. And I'll talk a bit later about that when I talk about Project Argonaut. But um, we, the, the, basically what happened is the industry said, Let, let's take our time, make sure we get it right before we mandate a regulatory standard and risk getting it wrong and causing lots of disruption. And so recognizing that and working with industry, uh, ONC has been doing a number of things just to sort of keep the ball moving. And one of them is the creation of ONC challenge grants. And they've had four or five of these to date, which are basically setting up competitions with cash awards for uh, developers to create applications based on fire that will solve interoperability problems. And they're in a number of different areas. Um, and so they've actually, I think they just had another one just issued the last couple of weeks or so. So it's just an indication that they want it, they support it, and they recognize that the way to keep things moving is to keep seeding the environment. They're also providing some disclosure, some support to the fire community in HL7 uh, for the ongoing development of fire as well. And one of the key pieces that uh, is implemented in the current, well, that, that's out there right now in the fire world, is this notion of the common clinical data set. So in terms of the regulatory mandate from ONC, you can't solve every problem all at once. So they started out with this notion of these 21-odd data elements, uh, which cover some of the most important information that should be relevant to the exchange of patient data in particular. Now these, um, I'll, I'll explain, I'll talk a little bit about resources later in the firewall. These aren't a one-to-one -one resource mapping, like these first five things on top are all part of the HL7 fire uh, patient resource, actually six, county preferred language. Uh, and some of them, like labs and vital signs, also collapses to just their observations from a fire perspective. But these are the pieces that are in place right now, uh, that are being put in place right now by major vendors across the industry. And one of the reasons they need to be there is because even though meaningful use is under evaluation, the third release of meaningful use was a common API-based uh, open API, 
and the intent and the, <laughs> the strong direction was to do it in fire. A number of EHR vendors do provide their own APIs, and those APIs may be more robust than just these data elements, but they're all different. And so if you had the option of writing to one API where the code you use or the application you have will work for Epic, Cerner, and any of dozens of other vendors versus writing one for each individual <laughs> proprietary API, it's kind of a no-brainer. It's sort of like how did Prodigy and AOL continue in business once the World Wide Web was actually out there. So quick view of the fundamentals of FHIR. Um, I talked of it as a platform. It's a next generation standards framework which is based on our history. And again, the key things are simplicity and implementation focus. The basic underlying technology grows out of REST, and this is a pattern for how you manage information over the web. And we're very familiar with it because we're doing it all the day, all the time on our, uh, on our phones. You know, this is what Amazon uses, this is what Facebook uses, this is what Twitter uses. This is a really critical part of why fire is so important. We're using the technologies that people are coming out of school, knowing how to use, wanting to use, and not really requiring people to learn archaic programming languages and environments like most of the healthcare environment really is. So it appeals, in fact, when you go to the FHIR community, unlike the HL7 community, which has a lot of old timers in it, the FHIR community is extremely young and vibrant, and we have 20-year-olds and 30-year-olds who are basically driving this. And so it is something that attracts the interest of people who are basically coming into the world of healthcare with the direct motivation of wanting to make a difference. Really important. Content is based on the notion of resources, and these are essential modular components that are sort of put together into applications. Um, they're like web pages directed towards computers, fast and scalable. There was someone here who uh, asked about, it looks like she's gone, to clinical research. And in the world of clinical research, it's kind of like a case report form. It's sort of a block, collection of information around, sort of organized around one topic. Uh, and it, it's independent of output, so you have to think of it more as an environment or rather than a particular standard to do something. You can handle web communications, you can send messages like in the V2 world or via direct. You can create documents like CDA, CDA documents, CCDA, continuity care documents, and you can provide services. And the services are the thing that Rim talked about very nicely, like the Travelocity example. Whereas rather than having to like, you know, sort of dig and find your way but, you know, get a push of some big document and sort of browsing through them at 100 pages or so of things. You just pull what you need and from multiple sources and put it together, a service-based uh, environment. And, uh, yeah. Resources are, as I said, these blocks of information. And if you actually look at them, they consist of multiple attributes of a particular um, concept. And so they fit into various different categories. Um, sort of start with the middle from administration. You start with the center of a patient and a practitioner and certain other things, organizations, for example. The, the clinical information is that second layer up there, and that's where we deal with things like allergies, uh, diagnostics, and you know, a lot of stuff are just these observations that happen, which is under diagnostics. And this is like a lab result or a vital sign or a, a, some other measurement that you have, a measurement result. Um, there are a set of resources associated with clinical reasoning, uh, reasoning to support quality measures and decision support. There's a whole lot of uh, stuff on the second layer to the bottom, which is really the core infrastructure, as well as the foundation pieces. Uh, FHIR can be represented in multiple formats. Uh, XML and JSON are currently supported. There's an RDF rendering as well, which is uh, close to being released. Um, and, you know, that basically describes these fundamental technological components and these foundational infrastructure components uh, that will pull all these pieces together. But think of a resource as sort of like a little blob of information, a collection of things, a packet at a time. And there are ways to actually put it together into large volumes. There's a, uh, a resource called Bundle, which is sort of like what you would do to put together all the patient information for a continuity of care document. And there's work now on a new resource that will be able to uh, represent, um, for data analytics pur purposes, large volumes of information, sort of in a column or purpose, just to analyze a bulk data at a time. Some of the principles of FHIR is that data resides at the source of truth. Uh, just like uh, Rim was talking about with APIs, rather than having to pull all this data or push it and then combine it into another database, FHIR sort of works like the web, is that it finds things and brings them at the point of, uh, <laughs> point of need, which is really nice. And you want to basically re reduce the need to make redundant copies of the data because that always causes problems. 
APIs, we want to pull, you take advantage, we talked, talked about push-pull earlier today too, you want to pull what you need instead of taking what's pushed. Uh, you know, there's a lot of stuff burying it in a, a, in a CCDA document, but sometimes all they want is one thing, just tell me if they're allergic to peanuts. <laughs> And it's a lot faster just to answer that question than to get this whole dump of information and sort of dig your way through it. Focus on implementers. This was a key difference. It wasn't for the modelers or the designers. It's for the people actually that make things work. That kind of really changed the focus of developing a standard from sort of starting with a top-down idea like V3 to let's try something, see if it works, adapt, check, check do it again. And so they go through multiple cycles in agile development uh, framework where things are tried and I'll, I'll see how, show you how that works a little later. Rigorous semantics in terms of uh, how we support various published terminologies and how we use them and how we represent them consistently. Um, one of the most important rules design for the core 80% that everyone needs and then allow for extensions for the rest. We did this in V2 a little bit but didn't have the controls in place that are there for fire. Um, the 80% rule is extremely important because the things you want to get out there first are the things that are going to have the biggest impact on the biggest number of people. And you don't want to get caught on the edge cases. That's one of the places where V3 got off cart. Somebody had a very complex case, maybe it was a regulator, <laughs> and they wanted to put all these special features in there, and that added, added complexity for everyone. And that really made it difficult for people to use the standard. Whereas here, let's try to keep it simple based on the stuff that we all know we need and then work on parallel modes to fill in these extensions. And some of those extensions actually turn out later to be important, and they'd be promoted into the core spec. Off-the-shelf security and authorization, these are the same types of security and authorization we have throughout the web that we're using for all of our applications, OAuth 2, OpenID, OpenID Connect, um, and HTTPS, as again, we mentioned that. Speed and scalability, taking very easy, it's surprising how little, a few lines of codes are necessary to write an application in Fire when you see it. It is using the best programming technologies available. Human readable and ease of understanding. Uh, it was designed with a place that's actually using, to, <laughs> using text that actually makes sense to people. Oh, this is a patient. <laughs> you know, it's a concept that V3 just didn't quite get, you know. It makes perfect sense. Easy to read, and you could read the text as a course, as a source. Um, so critical in terms of an open API, it's, it's more than an API, but in terms of open, there are no restrictions to using it. It's under a Creative Commons license. Basically, the only restriction is you can't steal it, say it's yours, and charge someone else for using what's free. <laughs> that's basically what Creative Commons tells you. And it's open source. Uh, you can find every piece that's out there. It's a transparency is a critical uh, objective of the community and everything, you don't have to pay to use it. You know, it doesn't have any limitation. You don't have to join HL7. Yeah, we need people to join HL7 to support it. But you know what, it's not a limitation because once you put those roadblocks in place, you give a people an excuse not to do it. By making everything free and open, there is no excuse. There is really no reason to build and continue to build a proprietary API if you can build a public API using Fire because what's the advantage? Since it's always under flux, it's actually a state level zero here, uh, there's a maturity model. And so where the maturity model works is that things are constantly moving around. And at a certain period of time, you sort of move it up and say, OK, it's now, this one is now graduated to the next level. Uh, this is applied at um, individual resource levels. And it's also applied to um, larger components. Within the world of fire, we start with resources. We have profiles that sort of tell you how to use those resources for a particular context. And then we have implementation guides, which tell you how to use resources and profiles to solve a particular business need. Okay, so you know, ADT might be an implementation guide, which will involve certain you know, patient resources and encounter resources and other things like that. Um, and so we apply the model to all of these documents, but all, all of these various components. But mostly we're talking about resources here. And so there's a draft level where someone tries something out. Level one is after it's gotten to a stable build that people have worked with it enough and decided that they can use it and try it out. Within the fire community, we have connectathons. We have them three times a year. There's also lots of others. Mayan was going to do one <laughs> this year, but they didn't quite get to that. Um, um, and uh, that's a way to actually test it out with multiple vendors um, from multiple points. And that will pass the connectathon, gets you to the um, gets you to the ability to get on a ballot for a release. Fire releases come out um, right now every 18 months. 
Um, after level four has been tested, published, published in terms of implementation guides and profiles, prototyped in place, uh, and actually often in production mode. And level five is international adoption. More than one country, these things are there. So each of these things, you can sort of level what degree of experience and maturity a fire resource is. is. Now this tells you, depending on what your risk assessment is, you'll see lots of new things that you want to use down at the lower levels, and kind of the most common things, which were the first pieces focused on, will be at the higher levels. And that'll be important uh, with, as we move on towards making it a normative standard very, very soon. Extensibility, I mentioned, because of the 80% rule, you've got to have a way to deal with the edge cases and the specific uh, individual use cases. Um, everyone needs extension. Everyone hates them. This is a grand slide. I should have put his, thing, his uh, name on there. Uh, FIRE has a framework that basically can address and manage these at the engineering level. And one of the key pieces, which is extremely important to uh, spreading the ado broader adoption of FIRE, is a registry which we're hoping to make available before the end of this year, maybe even by the end of the summer, uh, which will basically track, and track all of the available profiles, implementation guides, and eventually all the servers that support FIRE and where you can find them. So it's basically going to be a major, major resource in order to how and where to get FIRE to do what. Uh, and the idea is controlling these extensions because you don't want people to be creating multiple extensions uh, in different ways to do the same sort of thing. And this is where the power of the community comes in. In terms of building FIRE solutions that I mentioned, you've got the individual resources like patient and observation and medication statement. And then you've got these extensions, you plug them together in order to build your use case and solution. One of the key things in terms of, um, you, uh, Rim didn't talk about this in his talk, but putting a little bit, you mentioned just apps. And uh, within the FIRE um, world, uh, we take advantage of the Smart on Fire initiative. This actually started before or in parallel with Fire. It wasn't originally based on Fire, uh, but it's now gone because <laughs> Smart wasn't. But the idea of Smart uh, was to create a standard way to build um, browser based and, you know, and actually smartphone type applications that can use a standard API, a standard set of web technologies to create patient focused applications individually. And so, um, the idea is to apply these. Uh, there is a uh, app store within the smart world, if you just look at smart, uh, Google, I think, smart on fire. And uh, last I looked, which was really a long time ago, there were more than 50 of these apps available to do things. I'll show you just one of them in a minute. But the idea is to make it easier for patients not just to get a CCD document out of a portal, which, is, which Rim very nicely said isn't actually a magic solution for much of anything, but to basically just get the information you need. You know, if you're going in for a, some blood work just to look at your, uh, uh, your cholesterol count, it would be nice to have an app that just sort of shows you that and tracks you that and graphs it for you <laughs> and each time you're doing that. And that's what these apps in Smart on Fire are done. This is one of the cool ones. Uh, uh, it's a pediatric pediatric growth chart. And so it's a way for parents who might be concerned that their children are underweight or overweight or too small or too tall to see what's going on by just keeping track of this information. And all it's doing is going to pull this information from an API and it's going to present them in this nice graphical uh, mode. Here we have a little, you know, we have a little girl here with her parents. And so how does she stand up where compared to her parents, how does she look like compared to other children? Um, where they're, it would actually represent if there are particular features, if their parents are shorter than usual or something. And it gives them a sort of sense of, are they normal? <laughs> That's all we're trying to do. And this is a much simpler way of looking at healthcare information rather than having to sort of figure it out yourself from a text dump of a long document. Another thing that's going on using FIRE is the Sync for Science initiative. This, is, uh, this was part of the uh, 21st Century Cures Act, and it's moving along very heavily. This is a very ambitious project of engaging one million patients to share their genetic in information as well as uh, phenotypical information uh, as a research tool. And Josh Mandel, who also was the guiding force between Smart on Fire, is uh, one of the lead investigators on this project. One of the questions that was asked earlier was, uh, what, what are the big players doing? Well, Josh um, is, um, was recently hired by Google Verily. Uh, Josh, who came out of um, Harvard um, Medical School. Um, and um, in another key person from Duke who actually didn't, might, I might have done the previous app I showed, uh, Ricky Bloomfield was hired by Apple, <laughs> incidentally, because they've both been involved, in, both MDs who have been deeply involved in the FIRE community. So it's giving us an indication. Google's gotten very involved with FIRE. They've just uh, con contributed 
uh, Google Cloud to host all the Fire servers for the community, which was a big deal. So we're seeing these organizations start to get deeply involved. They're paying attention, and they're building up internal um, capability to do that. So this is a really cool resource in terms of putting together these uh, one million patients as a research repository, and it's, uh, it's actually well underway. They're actually starting to collect data now. Uh, there was a presentation, a whole session on learning health system with Chuck Friedman the other day, right? One of the conferences. And, um, you know, um, he, I don't know if they talked about fire at all, but, you know, if you look at the vision, this is from Tom Sowell, but if you look at the vision over here of what it is, is uh, a lot of people think of learning health system, oh, it's connecting like clinical research for drug companies. No, that's not it. <laughs> it's that every time you see another patient, that patient should basically, you should be able to learn from that experience so that the next patient benefits from it. And that's a fire type thing, you know, is that every time, you know, I, I, in my case, the story I use a lot is when uh, um, I, I have high, high LDL cholesterol and uh, I was given a statin and I, a few weeks later I could barely move. You know, I was getting the muscle reaction. It was a common statin reaction. And so I got another statin later and it, went, and it was a lower dose and it was okay after that. But the bottom line is we should know why. <laughs> and when we find why, we should be able to use that to inform future patients. And that's how I think of a learning health system. Again, it's another thing that you could see FIRE actually making it possible because it makes it possible to tap into multiple systems, multiple environments, and bring that information together. Argonaut Project. So Argonaut grew out of this pent-up demand from ONC to jump to FIRE about two or three years ago. And uh, industry stepped back and said, no, let's spend some time planning it and working together to do that. And what they, together, what they did was put together a uh, separate organization that took the fire spec, uh, actually the, um, um, I think they actually ended up with the DSTU uh, STU tube spec, um, and said, let's all make sure we can produce the same information out of our fire-based APIs the same way. Um, so I'll, I'll, I think my next slide shows some of the companies that are there. But the idea was let's check the market readiness for the standard before the regulatory uh, fiat is imposed upon people. Um, also trying to build a community within these companies. And what you have is sort of a pre-collaborative, a pre-competitive collaborative environment. So that you have competitors like Epic and Cerner working together to test these things out. Um, their goal was to create implementation guides for how to use FHIR for specific purposes. Uh, and so the, the common meaningful use data set, that's the, the, com, the, the, the CCDS I showed earlier, the common clinical data set, uh, um, uh, reproducing a CCDA, provider directory, security, and authorization. The things that they, that's what they covered in the first uh, series of projects under Argonaut. And also looking at conformance testing and publishing results of their experience. And the way they worked is they got this collaborative environment of developers from all these organizations together. And they were working on their sprint environment where they uh, would outline a set of short-term goals for four weeks and all try it out. Compare notes, either do it again or move on to the next thing. It took them a couple of years to get through the common clinical data set. I have to move more quickly. And these are some of the companies they should be familiar. Notice they're not just vendors, they're also providers like Intermountain. Uh, Mayo and others. And where are they? They actually published their first two implementation guides, one on using the common clinical data set web-based API, which is what's being driven for the meaningful use, three APIs that are now being released. Epic has released them for their last two versions. Cerner has released theirs as well. Many others are committed to be coming out this year. Uh, new projects are looking at appointment scheduling, and they're looking at another thing called CDS hooks, which I won't have time to show you too much. CDS Hooks is a decision support solution built within FHIR, whereas it is able within an EHR to monitor for a triggering activity, and what it would do is pull up a cord, a card, what it's called, it's kind of an old hypercard function, that could do certain things. In this case, this is an example, it's a Josh slide, uh, an example of, say, you get a medication order. Well, before that prescription is written, maybe check to see, is that the cheapest drug there in this case? That's an information card saying, well, this is what it's going to cost someone, but there's another drug that's bad that does the same thing that's a whole lot cheaper. Do you want to switch? If so, apply it. This is a very important function for clinical decision supports. HSPC is an organization of providers that are building a platform to be using FHIR. Uh, they, have, they are meeting regularly. They put together a really powerful sandbox, which can be used to actually build, test, and develop things. That's actually involved with provider organizations as well. 
Devices on Fire, another initiative that's called working closely with IHE. This is trying to plug fire into, uh, or applying to the device world into fire. Lots of opportunities to exchange information there. Um, other projects, mm, don't need to go into all these. I think the one at the bottom is interesting, CCDA on fire. I think uh, uh, that's been explored over the last year. Uh, at our most recent Connectathon, they had a demonstration where they're able to reproduce CCDA documents very quickly from fires. A lot of work because CCDA is based on the V3 RIM, reference information model, and uh, it does things somewhat differently than fire does. And so it's taking some time to get there, but we're going to imagine eventually that you'll be able to reproduce everything you're doing with CCDA documents out of fire. And these are some examples of who's involved in the fire and the open source community. The happy uh, set of servers out there, too, are also very useful. Uh, there's a number of other things out there. Connectathons, uh, these happen with every HL7 workgroup meeting. Next one, September in San Diego. Uh, usually involves something like between 15 and 20 different business case tracks that are being explored. CDS Hooks is one of those things. Uh, um, there, I'm doing some things in research there. There are things with workflow going on. Uh, and they, they've got tables put together with developers. We typically have been attracting 200 or more people at each of these from multiple different companies. They get together for a day and a half, and they basically try everything out. And then the second day, they demonstrate what they did. And you're actually seeing apps put together and seeing verification that these things work. This is one of the key components of moving up the maturity career within uh, Fire. These are uh, some of the tracks that were in the Madrid Connectathon most recently. That was a smaller one because we were in Europe. Not everyone could travel, especially the US government was restricted right now from traveling overseas. Fancy that. Uh, Clinicians on Fire is another community put together. This brings physicians together with Fire developers, uh, working together to understand how resources represent typical use cases of dealing with patient information. And they use a very cool tool developed by David Hay. Uh, that allows them to actually try creating resources as well as profiles to, to adjust the resources so they're getting the information they want, both being able to produce it out of an EHR and being able to consume it by applications. And uh, I've been doing things with biopharma and clinical research, uh, making the case that this is the first opportunity for biopharma to take advantage of electricity like health record data in a, in a uh, really achievable manner, rather than their typical historical method of just re-entering it as a separate thing, the same data over and over again. Lots of progress moving there. A uh, couple more things coming up in the value-based care community. There's been a lot of involvement from the payer community and others to use FIRE to present the information in order to be able to measure value-based care outcomes. Uh, this was a recent meeting in Chicago just a, a few weeks, a, few, a couple months ago. Uh, another meeting coming up in November prior to AMIA. Uh, this is one of the cool things that we started doing, Applications Roundtable. It's kind of a show and tell where we give each vendor 15 minutes to go up on, or, or not all these vendors, on them providers, what they're doing with Fire and what they can learn. There's one coming up next, I think, at LSU in December. Um, getting a lot of intention when people go there. It's really cool to see what people are doing. And you know, the idea is that this technology, as I said, becomes a hub and an ability that really enables all kinds of innovation that simply wasn't possible before because it was just too darn hard both to get the data and to use the data and to develop applications. I think the last piece I wanted to mention, a new uh, organization, we set up a separate nonprofit, a 501c3 nonprofit called the Fire Foundation. This is where the host, the registry application will be hosted and it will be a, an ongoing place to provide more support for the implementation community. It's, it's, it's separate from H. It's the HL7 Fire Foundation, but it's separate from HL7. And uh, I'll finish it up. Where are we going with Fire? We just released R3 in uh, March of this year. R4 will be coming out. I'll uh, be going to ballot um, probably next spring, just about a year from now. R4 is very important because the first release that will actually have some normative content. This will be ANSI accredited, and it means it will be a guaranteed backward compatibility. Not everything will be a normative. The things that will be will be the fundamental technology platforms and some of the resources, patient, provider, observation, probably a few others. Um, and then basically an 18-month cycle after that. Finishing up the summation, <laughs> here we are. So what does FIRE mean? Well, one thing, it can significantly drive down the cost of integration and interoperability for the reasons listed. Develops easy, easier to troubleshoot. It's a common platform that more people will know. And so you're just going to have the power of the community there. 
Competing approaches will still exist, certainly for the time being. We can't replace everything with fire. It's probably five to 10 years. And V2 will probably be around for 20 years or more. You don't replace things that work. You don't replace HIEs that are solving your needs. But what fire does is give you a way to address the needs you can't currently solve on an efficient basis. And that will continue to build momentum over time. And um, future impact should be cheaper to do interoperability, should be easier, should be able, possible to set many higher expectations and goals to do things that weren't even conceivable before. Uh, and uh, you know, increase spend on, well, there's more things. You can spend less on integration and do things more on output. Uh, on the market focus, um, the, you know, we'll see more PHR on the web because APIs, patient-facing APIs, will make information more available. We're not sure where that's, as Rim was talking about, where that's gonna shake out. Healthcare repositories, much better handle on device data management, which is a bit of a mess right now. And freeing data can enable new business models and new businesses. So that's it. <laughs>